Drew, tell people who you are, a little bit about yourself, uh, what your din setting is, and then we'll <laughs> go from there. My name is Drew Peterson. I'm a professional skier, and I use my ski career to advocate for things I care about, the biggest of which being mental health. And to your second or third <laughs> question, my din setting. I checked my din setting today because I knew you would be asking. I was evidently skiing at 13 din today. Um, which I guess is what I normally ski at. That's, f- yeah, I have no issue with the din setting. Com- like, I think it's just funny. Like, some people think that they need, I don't know, I work in a ski shop. Some people think they need to be at a 14 and they're skiing, like, you know, greens and blues and hitting their local park and trying to figure it out. And I'm like, your knee's going to come off of your body <laughs> one of these days. But like, but there's also like, I don't know, David Wise told me his is at a 16, 17. And I'm like, that makes perfect sense i mean when i was 17 18 years old i was definitely skiing at yeah you're 16 or 17 yeah it's kind of that makes me nervous yeah which is also ironic because i was a lot skinnier then than i am now yeah you're pretty thin now though yeah all right well well, anyway that's all that running anyway yeah Yeah. but to your other question (laughs) who am i i would hope that it takes this podcast interview to answer who am I rather than my just like one sentence answer. Oh, I hope so. I mean, that's, the, but, you know, it's funny is like people kind of identify to a few things in their life that like connect them to what they do. Like even I had Michelle on last week and her answer was like, obviously the cookie cutter, like Michelle Parker, I'm a professional athlete. This is what I do. And I feel like you can go a bunch of different ways with it. And I always just, I'm curious because this is your introduction to people who have either no clue who you are or people who feel very closely to you personally, right? Because you get both types of people in a podcast interview, right? It's like your best friends will listen and people who have zero clue who you are will listen. And that's the scariest thing about it, I think. So, I don't know. What's up, zero clue people? (laughs) Um, So talk to me a little bit about your career like how you've gotten to this point how you got started with solomon i mean there's there's kind of a lot to dig into here and obviously we'll talk about the film that you just released um kind of as we get into a little bit more but talk to me about why you became a pro skier how you got into it how you got into skiing in general the whole kind of background bit of it yeah how long you got (laughs) i got to it as long as as long as they're outside is how long we got all right Man, I started skiing when I was about like one and a half. Okay. Um, yeah, the winter right before I turned two years old. And when I was a little kid, I grew up with an older brother. And so I grew up in my dad's backpack while he was teaching my brother <laughs> to ski. And then once I started kicking my dad in the back and saying, me ski, me ski, that was when he decided my brother was good enough to get off the leash and I was good enough to put skis on. That's <laughs> insane it's insane how early people start skiing like it's it's so i mean i started at three two and it's like it's just a weird thing that parents are like you have to like go get on skis like it's that part of skiing has always been very confusing to me it's like why a parent feels the need to put what they love into this kid right away is is bizarre to me yeah definitely well i mean it's like that you know when you're a parent you want to support your kid growing up to be whatever they want to be right but like my parents moved out west in part to raise me and my brother on skis so like damn right they were gonna put us on skis when we were pretty young yeah was that was that a goal that they kind of pushed on you guys from an early age they they never pushed it on us the the big thing with my parents was just making sure that we were always having fun so Mm. if that meant we skied three runs and then we drank hot cocoa like then that was still a successful ski day okay um, and you know, it worked cause I'm still skiing for that same reason now. What, what was your relationship with your parents like growing up? I mean, cause you're like, I don't know in, I feel like in ski families, the relationship and the dy- dynamic is different than like families who just like go to soccer games or like, just like, I don't know, go on vacations to Disney world. Like I'm from new England. Right. So like everybody seems to be either a ski family or a sports family or some weird combination of both where they watch both and their activities and not like sports that they participate in. So I guess where did you fall in with that and what what was the family dynamic growing up? Yeah, totally. We we are definitely a ski family. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I said, my parents moved out west to ski and then to raise me and my brother on skis. Um, but like back in the 80s, my parents would go down to Argentina to teach skiing in the summer and um, still today, my dad is the most passionate skier I know. 
he skis just about every single day. Um, I haven't I haven't asked him lately how many days he's got this year, but I the last season that I remember how many he skied was 183, which he was very proud of because that is one day or half a day more than exactly half of 365. He skied that much in a year? Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. Well, I, I grew up in Colorado right. in Summit County, so a basin is open like October to June. Huh. Which was, you know, like that was a big part of my upbringing and my life was like growing up in Colorado, like the ski season was so long that like it really is the majority of the year. So mm. what yeah. was there a definitive point when you were like, I want to be a professional skier? Like at what age does that come for you? Yeah, well, like in elementary school, it's it's the classic question that your teacher asks, like, right. what do you want to be when you grow up? And everybody goes around and says, I want to be an astronaut, a firefighter, a marine biologist. Right. It's, it's very amazing how often marine biologists get mentioned lot, yeah. by, like, eight-year-old kids. People like fish. Kids like fish. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in Colorado. But my answer to that question to my teacher, if, what do you want to be when you grow up, was always that I wanted to be a pro skier Mm. and I think it's interesting because when I was younger it was like this you know just like dream that when you're a little kid uh everything seems possible and then as I started to grow up a little bit I was like okay well like you know it's possible because I'm in a ski town but it seems pretty far off and and you know one thing led to the next and things started to add up and um, it started to become possible, like kind of when I was in high school and, and here That's I am. Absurd. Yeah. How, how do you start building relationships with sponsors? And this is probably the last question I'll ask before we kind of get into your most recent project, but how, how do you build relationships with sponsors that are functional and allow you to pay the bills? Right. Because I think we all know so many pro skiers that are like, they're doing a million different jobs, they're doing everything they possibly can to make ends meet. Not that you're not, but like it seems like you're comfortable, like you're able to like make a career as a skier. So, how have you done that for yourself? How have you created relationships? And I don't know, how, how do you make it? It's like the most typical conversation I feel like a ski podcaster asks a professional athlete is, How do you make it as a professional? And what advice do you have to someone starting out? But like to me, it's always relationship based right? So how do you build those relationships to the point where somebody's like, I will give you money, I will give you product, and uh, we want you to represent us? Yeah. I mean, that's a lot packed into one question. For sure. So, you know, the biggest thing is it takes time. Like, I started doing this a long time ago. Um, the first money I ever made from skiing was contest winnings when I was 15 years old. Um, I'm 27 now, so I've been doing this for a while. Um, and there's a, there's a saying that I'll steal from Cody Townsend. Um, he calls it the 10 year overnight success story of like, you know, you're chipping away and, and doing what you can to chase after this dream. And then it feels like, or it looks like from the outside, all of a sudden, like things click. And for me, it took a lot of years, you know, building relationships with a lot of different sponsors. And even like back when I was, uh, you know, like 16, 17, I was um, building relationships with sponsors that I was doing a lot of work on the back end of it, you know. Um, even back then, it was focused more on like, you know, being a professional about it all. But, you know, fast forward now, my primary sponsor is Solomon and with them, it, it took a couple of years of conversation of like, hey, like, I feel like we're a really good fit together. Like, I'd really like, you know, to join your team. And, and, and they, were, they, uh, they were like, yeah, like, you seem awesome. But it took two years of that conversation to, to then sign a contract. And, and I'd say that when I started skiing for Solomon, when I was, when I was uh, you know, that moment when it was when I could actually call myself a pro skier. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it, that term gets thrown around a lot, especially now that like with social media existing, like everybody's a pro skier. Yeah. 
But and Davenport put it to me a few years ago, and he's like, until you're paying your kids' bills and your bills, like then you're a pro skier. Like until yeah. you're like paying for the things you need in your life with skiing money, you're a pro skier. Yeah. And I've heard people go all over the place about that answer. Like, and I, but I feel like it's like that's the that's the median, right? Yeah. You know, I I agree with Dav. Um, fortunately, I don't have kids so yeah. i don't have kids bills <laughs> yeah. to pay for right now um but you know at the same time like i'm i'm not gonna sit here and and talk shit on anyone who right. claims to be a pro skier that doesn't fit my definition of being a pro skier like right you know so be it right but if that's how they feel it's how they feel and yeah. honestly there's a lot of people that are better than a lot of pro skiers that aren't getting any money at all aren't getting skis or like going to the local shop and paying retail for shit Yep. So, and it's just, that's, it's the nature of the beast. It's the industry that we're in. And some people just aren't interested yeah, in that totally. lifestyle. The, the way that I put it is like being a professional skier was my route to being able to pursue my dream of centering my life around skiing. Yeah. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. You know, you could wait tables every single night for the rest of your life so that you get to ski every day. Yeah. And that is just as righteous of a path if that's what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's kind of got their own choices. Um, all right, let's talk about the new film project, Ups and Downs. What? Just tell me about it a little bit. Tell people who haven't seen it about it a little bit, and then we'll kind of go into some of it. Because I watched it, I've watched it a few times now, but we watched it all together last night and like just huddled around the laptop watching it. And it's for people that haven't seen it, it's it's amazing, and I think it's a must watch, especially if you feel like you have no one and you're battling mental health it will make you connect to something much more than just what's going on inside your head so for that i guess i should say thank you but why don't you tell people in your own words what it was about why you felt the need to kind of put that out there yeah ups and downs is my brand new film project just dropped yesterday so go check it out on youtube but it is a raw and vulnerable expose that mirrors my personal mental health journey with the mountains and valleys of ski touring. And that is a very PR one sentence (laughs) answer. So because we got a while to talk about this, I've been on a hell of a road in really the past four and a half years is what it was all encapsulated down to. But I've struggled with mental health my whole life. Yeah. Even before I knew that it, could be labeled or fit under the umbrella of mental health. And now this film dives into what that journey has been like. And specifically in the last four and a half years, things came to a T for me. I had a really bad accident in the mountains, which happy to get into. And Mm -hmm. the, the trauma of that accident resulted in PTSD. And I did not have the toolkit and I didn't have the ability to cope and to deal with those emotions and the journey that I've been on since that accident was all the way to the depths of contemplating suicide all the way to the flip side of that which has been learning how to ask for help asking for help in this way the first time in my life yeah and going to therapy healing being diagnosed with a whole lot of other shit post-concussion syndrome from brain injuries type two bipolar disorder and really rebuilding myself, renovating my life. And now it's, it's amazing to be four and a half or almost five years after that accident and have packed so much into this, you know, moment of my life to get to where I am now, to be able to share it with other people. And, you know, to your other question, like why, did I feel the need and why am I sharing all of this is that when I was really struggling, when I was at my worst, if I could have heard my own story, then it would have been everything to me. It would have been a survival guide. It would have helped me get help a lot sooner. And my hope was that sharing my story publicly could be that for somebody else. Yeah, uh, I think it is. And I think it are like it's been out for 24 hours, and I think it already has. You, I'm sure you've seen the messages, and your phone's blown up, and like people are great. And I, 
I don't know. I just wonder how long it took you to feel comfortable talking about it. Because that was one of the things that I've like, I've been for me, it's been five years. It's been almost the same amount of time where I was like, first, they were like, okay, it's ADHD. And then from that point on, I was like, depressed about having ADHD and feeling broken and not feeling like I had control of myself, anything to do with my life. And like, it's almost like once somebody tells you something like that, you feel like, oh, there's a reason that shit's been fucked up for so long. And you would think that that would help, but it doesn't help because you're like, I'm a science project now for everybody else to look at and go, here's a, here's a problem, a definitive problem with that person. And it took me forever, like up until the last year to start talking about it. And so I just wonder at what point were you like, I feel comfortable talking about it because it's not like you're talking about it with your friends you're putting it out publicly like you're putting it out into the world and for a long time mental health has been this like you're weak you're not strong enough to get through it and it's it's exactly how i felt like you put it in better words than i think i would have but it's like your self-worth in the, especially in the ski industry is always like, how much skiing can you do? What can you get done? What can you do? Like, how much can you do for this community and how successful can you be within it, right? So if you're battling that and battling everything that's going on inside your head, it's it's an insane thing. So I guess my, my only question here is, at what point did you feel comfortable sharing to more than just the people around you, to more than just a therapist? I definitely identify with like a lot of what you just said, you know, Um, maybe we'll get into it, but like that double edged sword of of receiving a diagnosis for sure. Um, But as far as talking about it and and sharing this stuff, um, you know, for me, there have been other people's stories that were really instrumental in me making it through. And because I leaned on other people's stories, I knew that eventually I might be able to get to a place where I'd be able to share myself. And now I am to that place. But at the time, you know, there's definitely doubts of if I would ever get here. But I expressed to my therapist pretty early on that at some point I thought I would want to. And she shared a metaphor with me that is when you get on an airplane and they give the classic safety talk, the stewardess uh, says when the cabin loses pressure masks will drop from the Mm -hmm. ceiling and please make sure that your mask is securely fastened before helping those around you and that was a metaphor she shared with me years ago and for years I thought that I would get to a place where my mask was rock solid and I kept getting closer and closer I got to a place where I was able to finally share what I was going through with my family. I was able to finally share with a really close circle of friends, you know, just a handful. Yeah. And I I kept thinking, like, you know, I'm getting closer to that mask being on. And then I came to a realization, um, I guess a little over a year ago, it was definitely gradual, though, was that my mask is on. I'm confident that my mask is not going to fall off, but it is not sealed. It is not leak proof Mm. and it might get jostled around a little bit, but now I have the toolkit and I have the confidence that I can readjust my mask. I can tighten the straps and I can keep on breathing. And because of that fact, when I had that realization, I came into that acceptance that that was the level that I personally felt I needed to get to to be able to share myself with others. That was when I knew that I was ready to talk about this stuff. And, you know, it's certainly helpful that I've, you know, had this ski, ski career for a long time, so I'm comfortable telling stories. I'm, I'm also a writer, and, and so, like, with experience telling stories, like, that definitely helps too. Like, there's definitely a comfort level already built into that. Um, but yeah, it, it took time and I think it took a lot of acceptance that I didn't need to be 100% perfect and sound to be able to start sharing with people. Yeah. And I think it it also must, 
help to share a little bit too, right? It must make you feel better because you're letting it off your chest and other people are like, oh yeah, like I fucking feel, right? And that knowing you're not alone thing, I think helps tremendously. But th- some of the stuff that you talk about, like suicide, like the thoughts of it, it doesn't get talked about um, in media nearly enough. And it doesn't get talked about in a way that's as raw as the way, like you talked about sitting on a park bench and thinking about what car would be the best to jump in front of. And like, when you said that I picturing myself driving home in the dark, thinking about what guardrail I'm going to turn my car off into, you know? And it's like that kind of stuff is relate. Like you hear that and you're like, I fucking know where his head was at in that moment because I've been in that moment a hundred times and not turned the wheel. And like, it's taken everything in my power to not turn the wheel off into the river. But you know, like that, that battle is constant. It still happens, but like it's to hear other people have experiences like this makes us feel like a community when a lot of times mental health makes you feel like nobody understands at all, right? And that's been the biggest frustration to me is like I feel like I'm going crazy in my own head. Like I'm, I've been from everything from like getting home from work, having a perfectly fine day. And then all of a sudden I'm like bawling my eyes out for hours at a time on my kitchen floor, face down, nothing like for no reason, like for, for seemingly no reason from the outside looking in and everybody else is like, Oh, you have a great life. You get to travel, you get to talk to people, you get to hang out with professional athletes and do this conversation. I'm sure it's the same situation for you. It's like you go skiing every day. You're supposed to be happy. And you put on that happy face around everybody all day long and you get home and you're just like, I want to tear it off. Like I, I, I don't even know if there's a question, but that's, that's a, that shit's real, man. Like that, that is so raw and so important for somebody that's struggling to hear because I can tell you, like I'm fucking going through like now and I'm getting better. Like I've got, I'm starting to get like real help, but especially during the pandemic, it's exposed a lot of shit because like I tried to get a therapist all summer. And all summer, I'm getting caught. Ah, we're busy. We got too many people. Ah, no, nobody's available. And I'm sure people have had this too, where you don't have the ability to even go. You're trying to grasp for help, and there's nobody to help you, right? So you're you're trying to ask for a lifeline, which is already hard as fuck to go. Like I'm, hey doc, I'm going fucking crazy right now. I don't know what's going on. Something's nothing's wrong, but everything's wrong. It's just so fuck. It's so real. And that's what was so amazing to me about the film. I actually, when you put out that you were going to put it out there, I wasn't sure if it was going to be like an ad, basically, right? Like an advertising piece. Or if it was going to be something that actually changes the way people think about it. And I think it's the latter. So, Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean it. And I I don't know. Yes to everything that you just said. And... One of the real key intentions with this film, for me, was to pull no punches. Yeah. And to go all the way deep. And the reason that I do that, and the reason that I made this film, is because as many people are talking about mental health right now, I sincerely believe that simply talking about it and using the words mental health is not what's going to change our culture. For sure. Because there are people like me and you and so many people out there who are so deep in the depths that some small surface level acknowledgement of the simple words mental health is not going to communicate that to them that they are not alone when i started being able to talk about these things with family and then with friends and that started to grow you know that circle grew a little bit to chairlift conversations and people on the skin track and And, you know, people who I hadn't known for that long, I started talking about these things. And the one piece of my story that I still felt like nobody ever understood, because people understood a lot of it, and and I was met with with a lot of people really grateful for that that I opened up because they looked at me like that was the first time that they had somebody to talk to. Yeah. But in those moments, I still felt like nobody understood the suicidal piece of me. And the truth in that is that 
to talk about the hardest things, to talk about the deepest, darkest pieces, there needs to be somebody to break through that barrier and to start that conversation and to create the space for other people to talk about the same things. Mm. And, you know, in those conversations, when I'd open up to people, I didn't open up all the way, you know? I'd say that I was having thoughts of killing myself. I'd say that I was suicidal. But they didn't know what that actually looked like. They Mm -hmm. didn't know that that meant sitting on the edge of my bed, staring at a box of eight bottles of opioids at 2 a.m. It's fucked. Like, that was... That was a fucking yes or no moment in the absolute worst way. And the people who have felt that and who feel that right now are not going to identify with and they're not going to be seen unless we talk about the real shit. And that is exactly why at the start of the film I say it's not like anybody wants to talk about, like, suicide. Yeah. (laughs) Like... No. But we have to. That's what is needed to create change. And a huge part of the film that we put a lot of emphasis on, both said and unsaid, is a lot of the shame that I experience. Because like you said, you have an amazing life. I have an amazing life. Like, that is a true statement. But also, we have this other side that is really brutal, that comes with depression. Mm -hmm. And... I felt a lot of shame for that dissonance or for that paradox in my life where, you know, the, the outward life that most of the world was seeing was me being a professional skier mm-hmm. and having this, you know, amazing rock star paradise life. Yeah. But then the other side, being somebody who's thinking about killing myself and having such deep depression that it really is feels fucking impossible to get out of bed like that dissonance that juxtaposition led to a lot of shame in my mind Mm. and this i steal 100 percent from brene brown but what she says is shame is rooted in the silence and the only way to break that shame is if we start talking about it yeah. Start talking about the things that we feel shame around. And that's why I do what I do. And I I can tell you it's been it's been fucking incredible to be able to start talking about these things because I feel like I get to be myself every single day. There's yeah, well, some sirens coming by. <laughs> Not for us. Not for us. At least to our knowledge. <laughs> Sorry about that, listeners. <laughs> But we're we're at the Mountain Gazette <laughs> office, so can't can't say that it wasn't yes, them. Yeah. Um, where we we were talking about something super important. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, it, dude. It, we need to talk about it at more than just the surface level, and I think that's where you're right. I did the same thing, right? I shared the surface level, like I'm not good right now. Like that was the first thing I started saying to people was I'm not good. Like how are you? I'm not good. I'm I'm struggling. Because some days I'm on the moon and some days I like, I, I can't stop crying and crying and crying. And the way that it's put and the way that it's shown in relation, I guess, to mountain culture and climbing a mountain and the peaks and valleys, I think, is a great way to talk about it because it's understandable for people who haven't felt this, right? I've talked to so many people and they're like, yeah, man, I've been sad too. And I'm just like, I want to tear my hair (laughs) out of my head. It's not that I'm sad. It's not that I'm ungrateful. And you do, you feel that shame. You're like, my, my dad was an immigrant. His dad died when when he was 18. He raised four kids on his own, moved to this country, worked at gas stations, sent all the money out. Like I have a fucking easy life. And I'm not able to get myself out of bed some days and make it work. But I'm putting on a smiley face and I'm pretending that it's fine even though nothing is fucking fine. Like it is so the opposite of fine. The amount of times that I've just like got in my car and screamed at the top of my lungs, right? Or the amount of times that you just think... I told my psychiatrist the other day 
it's not like I want to kill myself. It's that I wish something would happen that would make me not exist anymore. And that's actually one of the things that I feel is very different between what you're going through or still going through and went through and what I'm going through is when you had that accident and you see the video of that accident, like of the rock falling, as you described it, the size of a microwave falling on your head, you want to live in that moment, right? Like in that moment, I was like watching it last night. And I'm like, that dude's a fucking hardo. That dude's a, like, that dude is a bad because you want to live to the point where we're like, we're fucking getting off this mountain and I'm getting help. Right. That to me was like proof that you want it. Like there's something there inside of you is that that's like, I want to, I want to be here. I want to live. Right. Post that accident, I can't even imagine how things feel and how everything kind of comes together. So I guess I kind of want to talk to you about the difference before that moment and after that moment and what changed at that point. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think for the listeners, we should also like explain the accident a little bit. Yeah. So um, I was in 2017. I was on a road trip to climb and ski the highest peak in every state of the American West. And on May 10th, and I remember that day for damn good reason, I was climbing and skiing Mount Hood, and we were transitioning. Um, A couple things had led to this point where the beta we had on the line that we were skiing didn't add up with what we saw once we got in there. Um, It was on the east face of the mountain. It looked like there had been a wet slide the day before. Didn't really look like it was passable anymore. And things were heating up quickly. So we made the decision to climb off of that face to get away from the warm temperatures. We hadn't seen any signs that things were bad yet. Mm -hmm. We hadn't seen rock fall we hadn't heard rock fall the entire day. There was no indication of any wet slide danger, nothing moving. And the first sound of rock fall that we heard was from directly above. And I was transitioning my skis, had my skis out in front of me. And, you know, when you spend a lot of time in the mountains, what you are trained to learn is that when you hear the sound of rock fall, you duck you don't look up and try to dodge it so I basically like kind of hit the deck and turtled over and um the the rock you know like you said was about the size of a microwave it fell from probably about 40 feet above me directly off the off the cliff that we were below and it landed on the back of my head on the back of my neck on the middle of my upper back and on my left arm, on my forearm, there's still oh, the yeah. scar. It's, Fuck. it's a little bit of a smiley face. It's healed incredibly well. It's incredibly ironic. Afterwards, it, it uh, fully looked like a smiley face, which was kind of fucked up. <laughs> um, yeah, and it was, it was a very scary, very dire situation and... and you know, we can get into a lot of hypotheticals, but I'm quite confident that if I hadn't been wearing a helmet, that I would not be here today. That mm. I would have died. And my arm was bleeding like crazy. And so we decided to tourniquet my left arm. And we decided to not call for rescue there. One, because it would take too long. And we needed to get me to help. And two, because if we called for a rescue there or even on the summit ridge, then we were putting other people in serious danger. Mm -hmm. And I was in fear that if we called a rescue that somebody else would either get seriously hurt or die there that day. Um, So we climbed off of that face of the mountain. We climbed off the east face up to the summit ridge and then skied down the south side of the mountain, which people who knew Mount Hood goes down to Timberline Ski Area. I was life flighted from there down to Portland, Oregon, to a trauma center. And um, you know, long story short, I ended up being relatively okay physically. 
um, but it takes the entire film to capture that I wasn't okay mentally. Um, but now I guess we can get into, you know, more of your original point of, of what things were like before and after. So if you, if you have a question to open it with. Yeah. I mean, I, first of all, I mean, props on decision-making to both you and your partner, right? Because I mean, that's a string of incredibly difficult decisions to make like quick on the spot trauma, get to a place where you can actually get help. Right. So uh, that part I was like immediately impressed by like, because that's not a thing that everybody has. And I think for that reason, you are fortunate like to have that, like, and to have a backcountry partner with you. That's also on the same page as you, but that, I guess I want to know why that moment specifically changed the way that you thought about everything and the way that you felt, I guess, because it seems like that was the definitive turning point for you. Yeah, totally. You know, it was, it was the first time in my life that I looked death square in the face. And anyone who's ha- ever had a near death moment would know what that's like but a lot of people don't and things get very real very quick but they also get very simple you know like you said in that moment it was very clear that I wanted to live and it took a lot of strength you know mentally and physically to get off of that mountain but with that being the first time in my life that I looked death, you know, head on, that was a it was a turning point. It was a it was a it was a point where things came to a T, and you know it's it's easy for me now to see that and see the silver lining in that 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 was what sent me on this mental health journey. But at the time, it was this super obscure reckoning where afterwards, I'm trying to rationalize through everything because that's the way the human brain works. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, man, first rock that falls that entire day and think about the square footage over that entire mountain. Think about every fucking rock on that whole volcano. And the first rock that falls, falls from above me. And where does it land? In the fucking, you know, two square feet that I'm occupied in, in that moment in time. And... You can't rationalize your way through that. There's there's no way. And, you know, I'm sure that there will be some people listening to this who are religious and, and, you know, will say it happened for a reason. And, you know, a lot of this experience has made me become a much more spiritual person, but I'm not religious. And I tried so hard to, like, rationalize my way or think through religion, think through it spiritually of why that happened or why I lived from that. But, man, that was difficult. And then, you know, actually, you said something earlier that you didn't want to kill yourself, but you wanted something to happen for you to not be here anymore. Mm -hmm. And afterwards especially the winter right afterwards i just started looking around like at everything as opportunities to die Mm -hmm. yeah and that's a terrifying headspace to be in the mountains um you know like looking at a slope and being like oh like yeah that might slide today i'm like i should ski first like It's a fucked up way to think, and it's and it's not okay too to to my backcountry partners and and you know I never I never succumbed to that way of thinking where I would fall into those traps 
that I made decisions in a way that I would hopefully die. So in that sense, I was still loyal to my backcountry partners, but holy shit, was that a lot of weight on my mind every single day. And, you know, we, we started this by saying, like, what was it like before and what was it like after? But the point that I wanted to make there was this was my reckoning with death. Mm. And it felt like death was much closer now. And I think that is, that's also part of why the suicidal thoughts became much more real after the accident and became much more intense. Um, before the accident, I, I struggled. I wasn't often suicidal. I was definitely depressed, but I didn't even know that I could label that as depression right. back then. Um, you know, but the, the, the first, the first memory I have of suicidal thoughts is from when I was in the fourth grade. So I was nine years old. And so these tracks in my brain and, and those struggles weren't new after that accident. They're not new now, but they got a lot more intense because of the accident. Mm. And fortunately, things got bad enough after the accident that I went so low I had to ask for help. Because I think that I could have gone on the rest of my life if things hadn't gotten that bad without facing this. And so in that sense, you know, like people see when they watch the film, I'm grateful for that rock. I'm grateful for that experience because it put me on this path. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an interesting and it's a crazy fucking thing to talk about especially if you're someone who doesn't understand those types of feelings or those thoughts or those those emotions or even how you get into that mental space and i don't uh, to me it's like i i don't know exactly how it got this bad but i remember the first time that i said oh i just i want to kill myself and i was joking like it was like a joke but i was sad and it was like it started that way and it built and after years and years and years it became a thing that was like actually like a really big fucking issue and that's when you start realizing like okay i need to help and i actually in in a similar way i credit the pandemic for wanting to talk about it right because i realized that so many people in particular i've talked about this before adam campbell um who's a runner has talked about you know triggering an avalanche that ended up killing his wife you know like that to me and him talking about that was like the reason that i felt comfortable to post and be like and just baseline stuff, not stuff that is as deep as what we're talking about right now, but just stuff that if you're like, if you're hurting, you can reach out, right? Like just so that you people know, because that's what that guy did for me. And he was, and he said it before, he's like, he's doing it almost as a journal for himself to get him through the really hard fucking days. And it's, it, it's just such a fucked up thing that exists for people. And I don't, I don't know. I get, you look for a reason for it and you look for a reason that it happens or why it's this way. And it's really hard to pinpoint like why you feel like this. And I, I mentioned it already, but it's like one of the most aggravating things that people ever said to me is like, Oh, I've been sad too eat my ass you've been sad <laughs> like you have not this is not sad like yeah. this is not the same thing you the only reason that i didn't kill myself for a long time was because somebody told me and i forget if it was a family member that suicide was the most selfish thing that you could possibly do because you're not doing it for you you're doing it or, or rather, you're doing it like solely for you without thinking about anybody else around you and how you're going to ruin the rest of their lives. And that's why to me, I was like, 
if something takes me off the face of the earth tomorrow, fucking good. Like, yeah, great. Like, done deal. And I, like, had this thought yesterday. Even. Like, it's like, it's still a battle that you go through every day. Like, even after you start getting better and being comfortable talking about it and kind of working through those demons, it's like you're still, like, that's some fucked up shit to think. And I guess the thing I kind of want to talk about a little more next is how you're doing and how you're dealing with it and how you still deal with it right because i don't think that shit ever goes away completely like i I think you like you said in the beginning you have tools that you pick up to deal with it better right yeah this is this is the rest of my life yeah exactly like Like we're not losing it there's there's no finish line to any of this yeah yeah um a few things i want to hit on first is um something super important you said was um you know, a loved one telling you that suicide was the most selfish thing that you could do. And I can understand how somebody on the outside right. would see that, hear that, believe that, and say that to somebody. Right. I can see how somebody who doesn't understand would. But to anybody out there, who is trying to support somebody who's in crisis, trying to support somebody who is actually suicidal, do not make the conversation about you. Right. Right. (laughs) The conversation needs to be about the person who needs help right now. That was... This person did not, like, real quick, did not know about me. Was talking about it generally. That's that's good. (laughs) I have had this conversation where I tell people for the first time that I am suicidal, that I've been thinking about killing myself, and then make it about them and how upset they would be. Yeah. You know. Like... I've been sad too. Man, don't make it about yourself. Be there. Listen. And create the space to help your friend, to help your family member, to help your fellow human being who needs that in that moment. So I just wanted to say that because I think what you said was was really key there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, to the to the overall point of how I'm doing now and, and, and what I do now to take care of myself, I think that there's another important point before we hop into that, okay. especially with the film, because... This film could have been very different. I agree. I could have made this film in a very uh, formulaic sense, especially when we're talking about outdoor adventure film. But anytime that you're talking about uh, a story, especially a story of a hero, I'm not calling myself a hero. Don't worry, I'm not that vain. Like, as in, like, a Greek hero. So here is the nadir. Here is the lowest point. That would have been my rock fall accident. And here is me climbing back out of that struggle. And here is me literally and metaphorically standing on top of a mountain because I've conquered this. I've conquered these obstacles. I've overcome these demons. And then I ride off into the sunset. Like, that would have been a hell of a film. But it's not true. And that's why I didn't make that film. I wanted this to be very clear that, you know, I I don't think that I could say it better than I say it in the film, so go watch the film. (laughs) But there is a line in the film where I say, we like to use the metaphor of climbing a mountain. And that is exactly that formulaic story arc that I just said would have been climbing a mountain. But I say in the film, that's an awful metaphor for life because... Life has no summit. I think I say it that way. You do. I hope Dead I say it exactly that. That's exactly like that. that, yeah. Um, actually, I first said that in my best man speech at my brother's wedding. So a little oh, shout right. out there. Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah. Um, I cried in that one too, just like in the <laughs> film. <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyhow, now that I've made a couple points, let's get to the original question. Um, but that is really key that this film isn't about you know, coming to a place where I've overcome. But that's all why this. it's that's and I 
am not like fluffing you here. Like it's, <laughs> that's why it's fucking important. Like that's why people should watch it is because it doesn't like we all watched it. I've, I watched it first by myself because I was like, I got to prepare myself. And honestly, I almost canceled this interview five fucking times because like, <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Like, but it's hard. You have to fucking talk about it. Right? But you're still here. And you're I know. And we're to yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I'm, here I am. Fucking give you a little flick. Uh, <laughs> I what's it's it's crazy to me that someone could make that other version of this film in good conscience that person that makes that film doesn't understand they are sad and they don't there isn't an end and i've like that's one of the things that i've come to realize too is like i've got shit I've, and for me it's like you got to figure out whatever your tools are to make it work for forever right because there's not a peak at the end where you're like i'm done there's no done like there's no done you're not you're not through you might be feeling better you might have highs you might have lows and we can talk about specifically the bipolar depressive part of it afterwards too because i think that's that's a specific thing that i didn't even know existed um until that diagnosis but let's let's kind of talk about tools and how you've gotten to the point where you're willing to talk about it you're willing to do interviews like this with another sad boy what do you do and, and like what's the what's the situation <laughs> what's the secret yeah what, <laughs> hey what do you have something for me <laughs> yeah i mean the the honest answer man is there's no secret there's no cure all and for me like every single day of my life now like, I have to face these things. It doesn't mean every single day of my life I'm suicidal. It doesn't mean every single day of my life I'm depressed. I haven't been suicidal in quite a long time, in, you know, well over a year, which is awesome to say. Good for you. It's, it feels really good to be in this place now where I can say that and, and mean that. But I definitely do still struggle. And the the changes that i've made in my life in this journey have been like night and day mm -hmm. i i fully renovated my life and that renovation of my life is why i'm able to sit here now and be at peace and, and be comfortable talking about these things what that renovation actually looks like has been um you know it's come in a lot of different ways I um, live a very different lifestyle now. Um, I definitely used to rely on skiing and partying, specifically drinking, to feel good about myself, to feel anything. Mm. And um, I have a much healthier relationship with skiing now, and I don't drink anymore. Um, that is... A key part of my story, but I always like to clarify that it's only a small part of the story because there's a lot of other things that go into getting here. Um, and I think, too, you know, in our society and culture as a whole, but certainly in the outdoor world, it's common for people to brush these things off as like, oh, that's substance abuse, you know, oh, they're addicted to drugs or guys an alcoholic like as like a asterisk like the rest of their story doesn't mean anything mm. um i want to say that because um that's part of why i uh hes hesitated to talk about my sobriety and why it took uh years to get to a place where i fully committed to it but i've been sober for two years now hit two years last week. So that's one piece of this. Um, you know, in the bigger picture though, there are a lot of other things in my toolkit. I live much more intentional. I live much more aligned with my values now. I have a daily meditation practice. Mindfulness is a massive key of what's gotten me to this point and what keeps me operating, you know, in that middle area where I'm not having rock star highs yeah, and I'm not thinking about killing myself. 
mindfulness yeah. has been huge there. I have a daily gratitude practice, you know, leaning into routine and, and having consistent things in my life that keep me going. That's huge. Sleep is, you know, I say there's no cure-all, there's no secret. Sleep is uh, probably the one uh, biggest, like, single thing that if I took that out of the recipe that I got right now, then, like, this batch of cookies would be pretty fucked up. Mm -hmm. Um, Sleep is massively important to me. You know, one of the things that we also touch on in the film is is that I had to rehab from uh, post-concussion syndrome, which is the result of undiagnosed, unhealed, untreated concussions. Mm -hmm. And sleep was... Uh, probably the biggest key in in coming back from that. And yeah. so definitely keep up on my sleep still now. Uh, I surround myself with a lot of really positive people. The, the friendships and the relationships in my life are built on genuine, deep connection now. Mm-hmm. They're not built on skiing and partying. My best friends um, I have met through skiing, but, you know, we can have conversation like this right and we have conversations that don't even touch on skiing anymore and i think that that's proof that um those friendships and relationships are built on a solid foundation now um you know romantic relationships in that sense too were different before and and now i have an awesome girlfriend and um she's she's my rock yeah she's huge in all of this and you know the other piece in that toolkit is the uh the pieces in that toolkit that 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 were there uh most of my life which one of them is skiing yeah uh skiing isn't a replacement for the rest of the toolkit um it is just a positive input and a good uh respite to keep my head on straight um and you know exercise as a whole movement um, for me, my, my other huge physical outlet, um, other than skiing is, is running, um, trail running and ultra running is my summer passion. And that's been, uh, huge for my mental health, especially over the past couple of years. And after I rehab from a lot of physical injuries from skiing, like running's been really key for me. Um, and then the last, well, actually there's, man. There's a lot. You know, as I as I start unpacking this toolbox, like I got a pretty fucking dope set of like <laughs> craftsman tools here. Yeah. Like it took a long time to like uh, you know, accumulate a full toolbox of these things. Um a lot of the film is about learning how to ask for help and finally going to therapy. Mm-hmm. I still go to therapy. And therapy is still a big piece of my toolkit. And you know, that's why that's why I mentioned like like skiing isn't isn't an escape and it's not an uh, and it's not a uh, substitute for the rest of this yeah. skiing exercise isn't a substitute for therapy and so I still keep up on therapy and I've got an appointment with my therapist on Friday which is gonna be really good to check in with her after this week of releasing this film. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, I had, I had two last week with her to make sure my head was on straight before. Um, so, so a huge thanks to her. You know, I still keep up with, with my care team that got me to right here. Yeah. My physical therapist um, has uh, been a huge therapist in her own right, yeah. beyond just the physical side. And, you know, still keep up and check in with her. And, um, you know, certainly on the physical side is, is why I still have that, you know, working relationship. But she's key there to, as well. And, and also keep up with my, um, you know, psychiatrist because um, she prescribes one of my medications. And then I, I also keep up with my neurologist. Um, my neurologist is who I met through... Uh, learning that brain injuries were a component of all of this. But he is the fucking man. (laughs) Um, You know, for lack of saying it more eloquently, uh, my neurologist, Jeff Kutcher, is incredible. And he is 
one of the few people out there who really understands all of this side of me. So I still keep up with him and, you know, we, we still work on a lot of things, you know, on the mental health side, if there's any, you know, symptoms that I'm worried are, you know, similar to concussion symptoms, I bring those up with him. Um, still struggle with migraines on occasion, but we seem to have like pretty sweet medication figured out there. And, um, you know, so th- there's a lot of things there. And then I, I hinted at it twice in there is medication is also another part of that That's toolkit. That's what I want to talk to you about next, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I was, I was hesitant. I was scared to take medication for a long time. I, I, I thought that it meant I was weak. I thought that it meant that I couldn't figure mm-hmm. it out. And uh, I'm so glad that I, uh, that I let my guard down and, and gave it a try because the psychiatric medications that I take now are so helpful and man I'm so glad that I like gave in and gave this a try because it's uh it's part of that toolkit and it's part of what keeps me operating like I am now yeah yeah it's a scary thing and it's a weird thing because when you go and see a doctor for this kind of thing or you go and you see a psych for this kind of thing they don't have the answer right away and they don't have what works for you right away. And there's a huge stigma with taking medication for your mental health. It's like, oh, this person's on happy pills or this person's doing this. It's like that Silicon Valley type, like everybody's on fucking whatever they're on, right? Like it, it, they're when they're used correctly and you find the ones that work for you, I can tell you firsthand, like... I did all of the other shit first that you mentioned in that toolkit and I was still not, it was still not enough, right? Like, cause you, you battle with it, right? I did the same thing. I didn't want to feel like a science project, right? And that's what's fucked up about the culture surrounding this medication is like, oh, you got to take this. You got to take this. You got to take this. Oh, like, is this person even the way that they, and you want, like, I'm envious of my friends that are just happy yeah. and it's like i'm never I, I i wish like sour one i mean for example it's like has no clue like has no idea how to be unhappy like he can be sour, he can be miserable he can be like cranky he has no idea what it's like to be genuinely unhappy and he said that to me multiple times it's like i i i, I know and that was the first time that i was like okay people don't actually feel this way um and it's it's important, but the medication part of it is something that I, I hope people don't shy away from because of the stigma that's attached because it can make the difference. It can also fuck you up. Like, so don't get me wrong. Like, don't just like, <laughs> don't just like go don't into just it. Take anything. Uh, find somebody you're comfortable talking to, right? Like yeah. find somebody that you can be like, look, these are the types of things. And like, if they're like, Oh, here's the answer. They're probably wrong. Like they're probably not the person you want to be talking to because you want somebody that's going to be like, look, we're going to try this. And if it doesn't work, we're going to try something else and we're going to fucking find whatever works for you. Yeah. And because you, want, you want a prescriber who uh, will listen and understand you before they you know, choose what to prescribe. And yeah. that, that's the key there. Um, you know, it's, it's important too to understand that there is a simple physiological side of a lot of the things that we're talking mm-hmm. about. There are chemical imbalances that occur in my brain mm-hmm. that all those other tools aren't going to just solve. Mm-hmm. And that's where the medication comes in. Mm-hmm. And I think I've found that uh, it's it's easier to get over that hump and get over that stigma and, and accept uh, that I'm going to take and that I do take medication when I, you know, understand that, that simple truth that um, it's science. this is, yeah, this is a chemical imbalance. This is how to get it back in balance. Like, it's science. And, you know, like you, like you say, it it's uh it's trippy and like you don't want to feel like you're a science project like you don't want to feel like you're a lab rat i think there's um the first time you brought that up was when you're talking about like the double-edged sword of a diagnosis Mm -hmm. and you know like 
I think a big part of that negative side is still uh, stuck in that stigma and shame of like, man, when I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, like, damn, does that mean I'm less of a person? Well, no, not at all. But having spent my entire life before that thinking that that diagnosis meant I was a different or less of a person, like, mm. I needed to get over that. But then the positive side of having a diagnosis is like, holy shit, I finally have something that I can point to. <laughs> right. I finally have an answer. Like, I finally have a fucking path to walk now. Right. And, you know, every diagnosis that I've received has helped me find the next step. Right. And as weird as it felt at first to feel like a science project and to, to get that diagnosis for the first time... Like, man, like, I'm glad I have them because they are a big part of what, what got me the help that I need. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, uh, I hope people listening to this that are like on the fence about talking to somebody about it and discussing if that's the right option for them do right. Like they have that conversation because maybe it's not for you, but uh, trust me, like, I don't know a long time ago. And I mean, a few years ago, I used to listen to like fucking Joe Rogan. Right. And he'd be like, Oh, just fucking beat yourself up and like work out a lot. And it won't be sad. And I'm like, just you're lift a more fuck, weights. Just lift more weights and do more shit. And I'm just like, in my head, I'm like, okay, like if I beat myself up more, if I fill my day more, there's no room for sadness, right? Fucking wrong. Like not how it works. Okay. You know, that, that said like lifting weights is like actually like a huge uh, positive input it's for me. It's amazing. I like, love it. It's it doesn't great. fix everything. No, it's not. It's <laughs> not like the fucking do cure. everything. That's the thing. It's like yeah. do all of it together. That's why like we keep referring to it as a toolkit, right? Like because it's not one thing. It's not medicine only. It's not because just taking the medicine and being a pile of shit is also not <laughs> the solution either. Like if you just sit on your couch all day and just take meds, it's probably not going to make you feel that hot either, right? So I think there's a, there's a, there's a line where we all kind of have to figure out what works for us and we all kind of have to figure out a path that brings us to not the peak, but brings us to tomorrow, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess we could talk a little bit about the diagnosis part, um, specifically with bipolar because that was one that I was like, when I got that diagnosis, I was like, no, I'm not. Because when you think about bipolar and the way it's described to you, you're like angry, happy, angry, happy. <laughs> and that's the only way you think about it. Or like that you're partying and having sex with hookers in Vegas. Like, right, exactly. That's what you think of it as. But yeah. it's not that to me, at least. And I don't know what it is for you. But for no, me, I'm, it was like. It was, it was like <laughs> I've never paid for sex. <laughs> okay, cool. well, since you get a gold star. <laughs> Didn't know we'd get to that question. <laughs> Um, I like that you look, I like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was weird. It's, and diagnoses are hard and it's, uh, it was, a, it was a difficult one, I think for me to hear. And it was interesting to hear you talk about it. And I was just like, okay, this is, uh, this is real. And I think one of the last things I want to touch on with you is like, I can't tell you how grateful I am for you to put the time and effort into something like this, like genuinely, because this shit matters. Like, and I keep saying that and I, I mean it to my core to put it out and to be real about it and to be intentional about it and to go, we're going to go on a fucking film tour and then release it. And then I'm going to talk about it and I'm going to go on a podcast and I'm going to talk about it again and again and again and tell everybody what's inside me and be vulnerable and cry and and put that shit out into the world is fucking insane. I give you all the props in the world for that part because that's fucking hard. So thank you. That was it, really. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I want to say one thing there is there's a lot of people thanking me right now and there's a lot of people saying that I'm really brave and courageous for doing all of this and I hear you and I appreciate it 
but I just want everybody to know, like, this is an honor for me. This is an honor for me to get to share myself, for other people to hold the space for me. And it's an honor to now hold space for other people. And it's an honor to create this space in our community. And, you know, sure, this is brave or courageous to, to be talking about these things and to be sharing myself publicly. But it took a hell of a lot more courage to live this. Yeah. It took a hell of a lot more courage to say, no, I'm not going to fucking overdose on opioids at 2 a.m. That took courage. The people out there right now listening to this interview, watching my film, the people struggling right now, that's what's taking courage. <laughs> sure. To make it through, to make it to tomorrow. And, you know, I'm getting a lot of eyeballs on me right now, and a lot of them are saying I'm courageous. But I just want to say, like, the people who are listening to this and watching the film who feel that, like, I see you, and I see the courage it takes to make it to tomorrow. Yeah. That was the thing that stuck with me the most throughout the whole film, was that image of you crying and saying, just make it to tomorrow, because that's the same thing that I've done a hundred times at this point, is, like, just make it tomorrow. I've come home to my friends and been like, I almost didn't make it home. I really almost didn't make it home. But I made it home. And I guess that's, if I have any input on this, it's it's that you just make it to the next. Because there is a better day. There is another, like, you have the opportunity every single day to make a change, for things to change for you, and to get better, but if you're not there tomorrow, that opportunity doesn't come. Yeah. And that's as real, I think. That's the gift of every new day. Yeah. Is that today gives us the opportunity to do what we can to make tomorrow better. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the other way that I like to word it is today I'm one day stronger than yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope that there's a lot of people out there feeling that, that they're one day stronger than yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, I always wonder how people are feeling, right? Anytime I see someone post about mental health or discussions around mental health, you see that headline. I'm like, okay, like how is this person actually feeling, right? Because on one side of me, I'm like, I just want everybody to feel okay. Like, and I just want to be okay. And on the other side, I'm so worried about someone putting something like this out there for clout, right? Like, it's one of the things that I'm like, I'm watch, I'm checking myself at every corner. There's a, I don't know if anybody else uses this term, and I don't really use it publicly because <laughs> I'm not trying to, you know, talk shit on everyone. <laughs> so I'll be selective. I with am. How I, say I am. It. So. <laughs> But I'm wary of performative vulnerability. Yeah. Because opening up parts of ourselves that we know will be received well and doing it for the clout, you know, that goes back to what I said earlier. That's not what's going to change things. We need real, honest vulnerability with pure intention. And that's you know that's why I'm here and I hope that it creates space for other people to to follow in that sense for sure you yeah. have to be aware of that because otherwise it's harming the people that are out there really feeling the darkness yeah that are at their bottom right talking yeah talking about it is very different than being about it Especially in this sense, because when you're being about it in this sense, it's one of the worst things to be and feel in the entire world. 
Yeah. <laughs> the, um... I was talking with a mentor of mine, um, Mike Douglas, just to name drop. Uh, D span. <laughs> uh, no, actually, the reason that I bring I, up Mike's name he's too. Great, yeah. um, you know, first off, I want to say I made this film with Mike Brown from yeah. Sweetgrass Productions. Yeah. But Mike Douglas was the first person who I talked about this film concept with. Mm-hmm. He was the first person to believe in it. So thank you to Dougie for that. Um, what I wanted to say, though, was I was talking with Douglas about this stuff. And, and he's like, dude, like, you're not doing what you're doing. You didn't make this film. You didn't write that fucking essay for Instagram likes. Like, there's a lot of easier ways to get clout than fucking, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Going to the depths of hell. Like, seriously, the, the fucking path I've been through to be here. Like, man, took a lot to get right here. Well, I'm glad you're here. It's great. <laughs> I'm glad you're here too, man. Glad we're Appreciate here together. It. Yeah. You know, actually, like, yesterday after the film release, I, uh, this is uh, very intentional about planning ahead of time <laughs> um, to make sure that I was going to be able to get outside yeah. and uh, get off the phone, get off my computer, because uh, even though it's all positive, it's not healthy to be tied to a comment no. section all day. So I went out in the mountains yesterday, went for a little ski tour. The snow was absolutely garbage. <laughs> <laughs> like the snow was so bad that like walking was bad. Um, <laughs> By the way, he said this on the chairlift and you could tell he's fucking like trying to be positive about it. <laughs> he was like, it was, it was, it, it was bad. Uh, but uphill was bad. It was, it was bad. It was like, bad. Like <laughs> people who know me, like know how much I fucking love skiing. And like, there's no such thing as bad snow. Like, I'm still going and, like, fucking skiing hard-packed bumps for the last month. So, like, bad snow doesn't scare me away. But anyhow, went out in the mountains for a little mini ski, ski tour. Um, I ended up going alone, which I'm actually glad that I did go alone yesterday. Because it gave me, you know, just, like, time and space to be with myself. And... I have gotten this moment so many times in my life in, you know, the past couple of years. Just like yesterday. Yesterday I'm sitting on this rock right along the Sierra Crest and just looking out at the mountains. And I'm really fucking happy to be alive. And the reason that I share that is... For those people out there who just need to believe that it gets better, you'll get to that point. You know, maybe it's not sitting up on top of a mountain and looking out at a beautiful view. Maybe it's getting to take your kid to soccer practice or... Maybe it's being able to read a good book. There's so many beautiful moments in this life where we all get to just take a moment to be grateful that we're alive. We're so all, I hope that everyone gets those. We're all really fucking lucky to be here. Yeah. Life is like this beautiful, amazing fucking mess. No, 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 no. Think about it. Think about it, man. Like, we, I don't mean that negatively. We are this amalgamation of molecules in a way that we can think and live on this planet that's just hurtling through space. So, that said, I think people are going to start thinking this is about to become a Joe Rogan podcast <laughs> if we get too metaphysical. And we already said we're not doing that today. So let's fucking bring it back. You got anything? No. Okay, I actually have something that I want to go back to. Okay, hit it. Is one of the things that I said earlier was that, you know, 
I didn't feel like I, um, when I started sharing myself with other people, I didn't feel like people saw and understood the suicidal piece, and that's why I'm doing this. And I want to share with the people out there that now I see how far from alone I am Mm -hmm. and that I was at those moments in time. These suicidal thoughts and the depths that I've been to, I used to believe I was the only person ever in existence to feel that way. And that is not true. These thoughts, these experiences, these low points are actually common. And I use that word very intentionally and very specifically. They are common. They are normal. Normal is the word that my neurologist uses. And I didn't believe him when he used to use it. And now I do. All of this is normal. So I just wanted to make sure that we got back to that point to hit on that. Yeah. People aren't alone in this. Because I thought the same thing. I'm just like, nobody nobody gets it. Yeah. It's Rogie's fucking ad. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if you didn't see the magazine, we're at the Mountain Gazette office. Uh, yeah, shout out to Michael. Um, <laughs> um, well, where can people find the movie, the film? Where can people find you? Um, and if you have any parting words or bits for people, now's the time. Yeah, for sure. Um, something I also want to like put across to people um, is actually while we're joking about being in the Mountain Gazette office is a question that Rogi asked me the other day, which is, yeah, there's people out there who struggle with mental health issues that are going to see this film and feel seen. But there are also people out there who don't struggle with their mental health at all. And they just have solid chemical makeup in their brain. And he asked me, why should those people go watch this film? And my answer to that was very simple. To those people, look to the left of you, look to the right of you. Look around in your community. Look at your family. Look at your friends. There are several people around you who are struggling. And if you can seek to better understand their human experience, you're going to be able to show up as a better friend, better family member, better member of the community, and as a better human. So for those people, I hope that this film still holds that value to them um yeah and then one of the last things that i also want to share is that obviously this conversation we've gotten is some really deep things and if you go watch the film uh 20 bucks says it makes you cry (laughs) i uh i watched this thing i don't know maybe a hundred times while making this film and The last time I watched it, I watched the final cut before we released it. It still made me cry. So, because this can be so triggering, this can be so heavy for people, I just want to make sure that they have somewhere to go with resources. And traditionally, you know, they do this on podcasts too, but um, in films or written stories, Uh, there's usually like this little disclaimer Mm -hmm. at the beginning or the end that has the suicide hotlines phone number. Mm -hmm. Um, I really should have memorized that phone number to say it right now. But at the end of the film, I put this link here instead of the suicide hotline and I'll do it here too. If you go to drew dash peterson.com slash ups and downs, there is a list of mental health resources there that I've gathered And in no way is it meant to be comprehensive, but it's meant to be a starting point for people. Mm -hmm. It includes the suicide hotline. It also includes what happens when you call that phone number, because that's one of the reasons that I didn't call it. It's because I didn't know what was going to happen on the other end of it. And...
So I gathered these resources, and like I said, it's not meant to be comprehensive, and keep in mind that I'm a pro skier, not a psychologist. But um, I wanted to make sure that somebody, that people have a place to go. There's also tips in there, it's a lot of personal tips, but also a lot of different resources on how to find a provider, how to call somebody you love, who's someone who loves you when you're struggling, um, how to find a therapist. Um, and there's also a lot of other media and stories in there that you can also look to, um, you know, for inspiration and, and to, to not feel alone because those stories were really key for me. Um, you mentioned Adam Campbell earlier. Like, Adam Campbell is amazing, dude. Uh, the, the space that he's created in this world and, and, you know, in large part, like, he created some of the space for me to be able to talk about these things. Um, a couple of the other people who are on that list are uh, Rob Crar, Corey Richards, and Alexi Pappas. Um, those three athletes are, are huge inspirations of mine. And, and yeah, so hopefully they can also hold some inspiration for, for folks. Um, anyhow, yeah, um, it was really important to me, you know, with all of this that it didn't, like, just end with the end of the film, like that there was a place for people to, to go. So um, Drew Peterson, drew-peterson.com slash ups and downs. And as far as where you can find me, that same website, or on Instagram and Twitter, at Drew Peter Ski. The reason it's Drew Peter Ski and not Drew Peterson is because a hot sorority girl already took Drew Peterson on Instagram. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, and as far as where you can find the film, um, you can find it uh, on my website. You can find it on my Instagram. It's on YouTube, on the Solomon TV channel. And the name of it is Ups and Downs. I love this. Thank you. I appreciate the time, as always. And for people that want to follow Drew, um, he's also a great uh, memer, <laughs> if, we're, if we're calling them that. Um, so there's more than just one reason to follow Drew. Um, and for people wondering, the suicide hotline number is 1-800-273-8255. Um, Drew... Thank you again. I appreciate you sharing your story. I appreciate you taking the time with me. Um, and uh, that's it. We'll leave people with that. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. Thanks for using your platform to spread this message, man. Of course. Uh, it'll mean a lot to a lot of people. So thank you. Fucking hope so.